Welcome, uh, welcome everyone uh, on this uh, on this panel on uh, inf investigating algorithmic systems and, and very specifically the, the panel will be about the, the concept and idea of uh, algorithm auditing. Uh, we have four terrific speakers uh, who I'll quickly introduce. Uh, I'm Joris van Hoboken, I'm a professor of law, of law at uh, Vrije Universiteit Brussels and a senior researcher at the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam. Um, and uh, we have four terrific speakers, I would say, on this topic. Uh, very, very expert panel. I will quickly introduce them in the order of uh, the way in which they will speak. Uh, and after that, they will give uh, opening statements. Uh, but we have planned uh, those opening statements to be fairly short, a uh, maximum of five minutes, I've given each of the speakers. So we will have a lot of uh, room for discussion. Discussion amongst the uh, panelists, of course, but also uh, discussion uh, with the room. Uh, so we have Mark Rottenberg, uh, the executive director of, uh, of EPIC, Electronic Privacy Information Center, who has been around for a very, very long time. Forever. And, uh, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, algorithmic transparency is one of the topics that, uh, that Mark and EPIC has taken up also over the last uh, five years, I would say. Uh, started to campaign uh, on that. Um, uh, Mark has, uh, and Epic have done, done so much work uh, on, on related topics. I will not. Uh, I will not tire you with the summary of that. But uh, he will speak first and, and say something about uh, what Epic has been doing in the U.S. and give his vision on uh, on uh, on the question of algorithmic transparency and accountability. So, a second speaker we have uh, Professor Bettina Berend who is a, a professor in the Department of Computer Science of uh, KU Leuven uh, University. And she's an expert in, uh, in computer science and information retrieval. Uh, she will speak second. Um, then we have uh, Yui Kuls Resta. That's really good. And um, who, is, uh, who is now at the Hans Bredo Institute uh, of the Hamburg University. Um, with a technical background, a PhD in computer science. And then finally, we have Michael Veal uh, from the UK, from uh, UCL, from the <coughs> from Steep. Yeah, the sorry. Science, technology, <laughs> engineering, and public policy. And uh, and Michael is a is a is a rising star in the in the discussions about uh, about algorithmic fairness and explainability, and has done some uh, very interesting work also in the public policy context in the in the UK. So with that, I will uh, give the floor to Mark to, uh, to, give your, uh, to give your introduction. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Joris, and thank you all so much uh, for being here. I really enjoy this uh, particular conference because it's an opportunity to uh, speak openly and candidly about the advocacy work uh, that EPIC is doing. And uh, many conferences, I would put together slides. But uh, for this conference, I put together a screensaver which I'm going to pass out to everybody. <laughs> we run out, we have a few more. I have some for my co-panelists as well. Now, I need to begin by establishing a little bit of academic credibility. Uh, our organization, EPIC, is made up of many of the leading experts in the US on emerging privacy and civil liberties issues. We have a wonderful advisory board and among the members of our advisory board are people like Daniel Citrone and Frank Pasquale. Now, I don't know if those names are well known to you, but they should be, particularly if you're at this panel, because both Danielle and Frank have helped focus ac academic attention with, I think, great substance and precision on the problem of the opacity of automated uh, decision making. Frank wrote a very good book a couple of years ago called The Black Box Society. Danielle has published a number of articles. And I've been thinking a lot about their work over the last several years, <coughs> while I've also been studying uh, data protection law around the world. And one of the conclusions that I came to, you know, we all become data protection experts in our own way and develop expertise around particular subjects or implementations or techniques. I tried to become an expert in what I viewed as the essence of data protection. If you were to get to the core value in data protection, what would you find? And I came to the conclusion that the core value 
in data protection is accountability over automated decision making. That automated decision making must be transparent, that it must be fair, and that it must occur in the context of the rule of law and democratic institutions. That's my essence of data protection, if you will. Now, the reason that I mention that is because today, of course, artificial intelligence and AI-enabled services, applications, and businesses, this is all hot stuff. You know, if you want to launch a company, you say at the beginning, this is AI-enabled, you know, candy dispenser, right? <laughs> this is AI-enabled chalkboard eraser. And suddenly things that look familiar are, you know, sexy and interesting and people pour money into investment. Well, that's their choice. But what I'm trying to do is hook the basic concept at the core of data protection with all this talk about AI uh, today. So let me be precise. About uh, four years ago, uh, Epic simply embraced a campaign theme. And we said, what are we going to do to get the public, not just the experts and the academics and the technologists, part of this debate? And we said, we're going to come up with a really cumbersome, awkward slogan. And that cumbersome, awkward slogan will be algorithmic transparency. Now, if you say it enough, it's actually kind of catchy. And if you put it on a screensaver, it can look pretty good. And if you search for it online, you'll find lots and lots of the work that we're doing. But that is actually our expression of an education campaign around algorithmic transparency. What are we doing with algorithmic transparency? Several things. First of all, we are lawyers in the US. It's almost a citizenship requirement, at least if you're living in Washington. We need to be a lawyer. So I wanted to live in Washington. I became a lawyer. Um, we use our legal skills to bring cases against the federal agencies under the Freedom of Information Act. But we don't simply ask for records that we're entitled to under the law. We ask for the processes that <coughs> determine the outcomes. We are trying to get the techniques, the rules, and the algorithms that reveal how decisions are made about people standing in line at airports, people crossing national borders, people applying for jobs with security requirements. And typically, we get two responses. One is, well, this is highly classified. It's national security. Uh, we have it, but we can't give it to you. Well, that's what going to law school is for. Because, of course, that's when we begin our lawsuits. And we have a big debate over, in fact, whether that is restricted as national security. Or they say, oh, it's, you know, it's very complicated. You know, we just put in some names and we get some results and we have no idea what's happening in between, uh, which is happening, I would argue, in more and more organizations uh, when people are willing to admit. Well, we say, that's very interesting, too. Because if that's what's happening, we really want even more so to understand your decision-making process because apparently you don't understand your decision-making process. So these are two legal strategies I've just described under open government laws to push back against claims of national security, to push back against complexity. The other argument we push back against is um, a trade secret or proprietary interest. An agency says, well, we'd love to share this with you, of course, but you know, we paid some money to a private contractor. They've developed a technique. And to protect their commercial interests, we can't release it to you. And by the way, we respect that argument. I mean, I think you have to consider that there is commercial value in a proprietary algorithm. But when it makes a judgment about an individual that causes an adverse outcome, then you need to find out how that happened. We've participated as Imiki. A uh, friend of the court in the United States in cases relating to uh, algorithmic based uh, decisions. And we've begun to draft a law for the United States uh, Congress. We recently met with members of the United States Senate in which we've outlined what we would call the Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2018. And it includes a wide variety of provisions, one about the transparency of automated decision making. Two, about requirements when data is gathered to provide complete information about how the processes will be deployed. And three, and most interesting, and perhaps you can provide some information on the EU side and then I'll stop, 
We've recently um, done more and more work on privacy impact assessments because this national commission created by President Trump sought to collect all the state voter data without conducting a privacy impact assessment. We said as part of our proposed new law going forward, whenever you undertake a privacy impact assessment, in addition to the requirements of saying what data will be collected and how it will be used, we also think a requirement should be to make the, known the technique by which decisions will occur. I'll stop there, but as you sense, our focus is very much on taking the issue of algorithmic accountability and operationalizing it, producing outcomes in the uh, parliament, uh, in the courts, and with public opinion. That's great. So l let me, uh, let us continue uh, with Bettina. Let, just one, one note, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, and you probably should be in what Epic is doing, they have a really great website, and there's a lot of links. There's a special page on the, on the work that is being done on algorithmic transparency. It's like a great resource. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, yours for uh, putting me on this panel. Um, and I've been very influenced by Mark, and I owe a great deal to Epic, and I completely share his view that algorithmic transparency is a super important part of where we're trying to go in terms of accountability and data protection. But of course, this is a panel, so I have to be controversial, and I will tell you a few insights uh, from the work, uh, especially on privacy and uh, anti-discrimination in data mining that we've had over the past few years. And my basic point here is algorithmic uh, transparency, algorithmic accountability, <laughs> algorithmic auditing is all fine and nice, but that's only a part of the big picture. And we should not look too small because uh, we're missing a big part of the problem if uh, we are concentrating on algorithms. So my main point is algorithmic systems are nested in other systems. And so the question is, should we audit these? Do we want to audit these? Can we audit these? And when we do that, can we get beyond a, oh, we need to look at context and everything is very complex stage. So how can we do this in a rigorous way? And the way that's uh, worked pretty well for us is to have this onion model of saying there is algorithms that are uh, embedded in IT systems that have interfaces um, most of the time so that user aspects come in, that these are embedded in information systems where you have rules of a business or other organization. And again, this in a wider multi-stakeholder information system such as society in a legal system. And uh, what I want to do is quickly run you through three examples of how these onion skins can play out. And I've tried to um, summarize these as three fallacies of assuming something about algorithms and of algorithmic transparency. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of research going on at the moment about measuring fairness and measuring um, other desirable properties. That is really important, but um, can we uh, assume that one measure of fairness captures what happens to different people and if we have the same outcome <laughs> for uh, different minorities, is that actually fairness? In fact, the same thing can uh, affect different people very differently. And I will not go into uh, the discussion now about uh, minorities uh, that uh, are very, uh, very um, prominent in the discussion at the moment. But um, thinking of the advertisements and the political advertisements that we get and that we have had so much discussion about that they're personalized what do these actually do to people who can't read and write properly? And this is 15% of the population in developed countries. So we're talking about a very big um, uh, group of people and we, don't, and we have close to no idea how um, these are affected by certain personalized offers. So um, what happens when somebody takes in some information is this first layer. Um, a second layer, is that we tend to think of algorithms in isolation and uh, when they're fair, we're, we're done. But um, significant decisions also in the sense of the GDPR are very rarely fully automatic, uh, as um, Article 22 would like, us, uh, would like to have us believe. They are very often semi-automatic um, and there is someone or a whole chain of people making decisions 
on top of the data mining based things, we've run a large scale experiment in which we showed that the way the interface is designed uh, and the way the task setting is defined totally influences how people deal with even sanitized algorithms um, and how there remain traces of discriminatory decision making in those situations. So don't underestimate the IT systems shell and the information systems shell. And the third uh, thing where we go even further outside uh, in the onion is that we're making the fallacy that we can think of incentives being very simple and uh, no feedback loops of system dynamics. Um, so um, well, the thing is these nested systems um, pro um, um, produce incentives and these influences how uh, decisions are being made. So I'm just going to give you one example that I've had a lot of discussions about in the past few weeks. Um, my country, Germany, has uh, instituted a law against hate speech uh, as of 1st uh, um, January this year. And there was a big discussion there uh, that because this is, in fact, uh, social networks have to take care of um, deleting uh, hate speech in a fairly short period of time, there would be an incentive to overblock because if they don't uh, if they don't delete stuff that's being recorded, uh, reported, then they would get uh, very heavy fines. Um, there was a huge shitstorm on all social media about uh, this is going to lead to overblocking, this is censorship, and so on and so forth. But what happens? Um, and I'm, and I, as, as I say, I have been uh, uh, following this discussion very closely and talking to the people who are enforcing that law. What happens? The social networks, of course, they live off the rage economy. They want hate speech. They live off hate speech. Um, so in principle, they have an incentive on this information system layer to underblock. But because they're against this law, it was very, uh, very tempting in the first days of January to overblock, um, just to make the case that this law has to go. And so, um, we, we think that there is this uh, dynamic feedback loop going on here on many different levels, mm -hmm. and we're underestimating that, and we shouldn't do that. So um, this was very much a general overview of uh, how we should not underestimate the system layers that are around the algorithms, and Yui uh, will now go into more specifics of how this could be done. Yeah, thanks, Bettina. So I thought today I'd talk about, um, so we keep hearing algorithm auditing. I'll just, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what different kinds of algorithm auditing uh, systems or techniques there are. And then we can discuss what the pros and cons of each of those are, because there are legal and ethical issues involved with pretty much each one of them. Um, so the, the, a lot of this work is from um, Sandvik and his, um, his collaborators from like their 2014 paper. So if somebody's interested in reading in more detail, you can contact me after this. Um, so the first thing that people think about when they think about algorithmic transparency or algorithmic auditing is to say, give me the code, and I'll take a look at it. And um, there are some very obvious problems with, uh, with that. One being that the code can be pretty complex. It can be evolving over time. But the most difficult part is that the code only makes sense in context as Bettina already mentioned. So um, the code without the input data to it makes pretty much no sense, because a lot of times the problem is not that the algorithm developer was malicious and wanted to do something really harmful for the society, but the input data ends up interacting with the algorithm in a way that ends up having societal problems. Um, so the question is, if we were to get the code, how can we do it in a way that is useful? So like because there are also issues about you know, people gaming the system. Once you know how it works, people who have incentives to game or manipulate the system, they would try their best to do that. And there are proposals for you know, trust, having trusted third parties who are doing the auditing. The second way that people have proposed to do audits is to ask the users. They say, OK, you want to know how Facebook is you know, algorithmically changing your news feed or what it's showing? Go just ask the people, what did you see? And the advantage of that is that you can also get a estimate of how people are reacting to the algorithm or what they think about the algorithm. But of course, this is really hard to scale, and there are always problems of um, recall and self-reporting in this case. People don't want to tell things that 
that they feel uncomfortable about or which are societally sort of looked down upon. Um, the third way, which is the typical way that many of the computer science um, researchers do these kind of algorithm auditing studies is to scrape everything. What that means is that you create a program that interacts with the platform. So for example, we did a study where we were trying to see if there was some sort of search bias on, um, on social media as well as on the web. So you can create programs that repeatedly query the platform. So let's say Twitter search. And then you could get this data <clears throat> and try and look at the data to understand if there is some bias that's being introduced. I'll come back to this study a little bit later at the end of the uh, at the end of my five minutes. Um, the problem with this kind of studies is <laughs> that it typically um, violates the terms of service, and especially in the U.S., this is a really big deal because the CFAA, so the Computer Fraud and Abuse, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Um, this makes it really hard for researchers to do this kind of research, which would actually tell us what is happening empirically or in the wild, right? And in fact, right now, ACLU, I think, has filed a lawsuit um, on behalf of researchers and journalists uh, saying that we should be allowed to do these kind of audit studies. So maybe we can, we can talk a bit more about this, especially because it's also becoming an issue in terms of publishing your research. A lot of venues are refusing to accept papers which have used this methodology. And I think that's for the society and for research, that's that's dangerous because that it really takes away some of the kind of things that we could infer about these algorithms then. The fourth one is called sock puppets, which is an internet slang, which basically means you create multiple accounts which are manipulated or controlled by a, one single entity, in this case, the researchers. And then you uh, probe the system. So you could go and create Google accounts or Facebook accounts, and then you try and see how the algorithm on Facebook is giving information to these sock puppet accounts. Um, and the, the issue that comes up, which is, I'm not sure if it is a legal issue, but definitely an ethical issue, is that you're intervening in, the, in, the, in this platform's um, uh, functioning. So people who are there, they are seeing what you're doing. Plus, the platform is also being changed slightly by whatever data you're injecting into this system now. And it, it's still an open question, how do you figure out what is the minimum amount of, of intervention that you can do to get the maximum amount of inference about the algorithm? And um, the last kind that I'd like to talk about are collaborative audits. And in the previous panel session, this was uh, brought up in, in brief. And the idea here is that um, we ask users, hey, can you give us your data? Or can you install this browser plugin, which makes some queries <coughs> on your behalf and just sends us that data? And there are some successful examples of this, one of which is the algorithmwatch.org. This, um, this is a system built by a German professor, Katharina Zweig. And um, there people have contributed their search histories. And this gets rid of the ethical problem, because here real users are making these queries. So the terms of services are not violated. You are not injecting extra data that is harming the platform or affecting the other users. Um, so these are the five main ways of doing the algorithm audits. And the thing to keep in mind while deciding which one you want to go for is also what your aim is. So one aim could be transparency, that you really want to understand how exactly the algorithm is working. Or your aim could be accountability. Who is responsible for whatever adverse effect that you end up observing at the end? Or it could be explainability. Uh, you just want to make sure that the people can understand why they are being shown certain things. And there are examples of each of these being implemented, both by the industry as well as some research that has been done to, uh, to promote these kind of aims. right? Um, and I'd like to just briefly end with a study that we performed where we wanted to see the bias, the search engine bias effectively. And till now, most of the studies which were done were done for web searches. And the assumption was that the algorithm is the bad guy. It is doing everything. And the bias that you see is only because of the algorithm. And we, we sort of, we, we also started with the same assumption, but we stumbled upon the fact that it's not just the algorithm. So imagine you go on Twitter or on Facebook. You want to search about 
whatever is happening. So CPDP, for instance, you go search for it. Um, the, the Facebook or Twitter internally gets all the data that is relevant to CPDP. So like all the tweets containing hash CPDP, for instance. And then there is a ranking algorithm, which is developed by Twitter, which decides what is more important than the other. And then that search results are shown to the end user. So that is what would be shown to me. And the advantage that we had in this uh, scenario was that not only could we observe these end results that were shown to the users, but we could also collect what was the data that was being ranked. So we could collect all the tweets containing these, uh, these query terms, a CPDP for instance. And by comparing these two things, the output that is shown to the user and the input that went into the ranking algorithm, you can make estimates about how much of the bias that is shown to the end user is because of the ranking algorithm that we don't know anything about, and how much is it because of the input data. So if everybody went on, on uh, Twitter right now and just ended up saying great things about CPDP, you would never see anything that is adverse, like that's negative about CPDP. And that's not because Twitter is choosing to you know, side with CPDP and only show good things, but it's because the data doesn't have any of the uh, negative things. And uh, it's important to separate out these different sources because if the majority of the bias is coming from the ranking algorithm, the platform provider is to blame. Whereas if the, a, lot of the data, uh, a lot of the bias is coming from the input data, these are, these are basically the users on this platform. So who's responsible or who's accountable ends up changing. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss more issues related to this if you have any questions. But now I'd like to pass on to Michael. Cool. Thanks, everyone. So, I mean, as has been emphasized here, but as we don't really need to say very much, software really matters. And software uh, has, always, has always often mattered in decision-making processes and constraining them, enabling new ones, shaping them. Um, from, as Bettina said, user interfaces uh, onto models and analytical models, the way that we quantify the world, the way we understand it. So one of the core things that we come to when, it's all, when we talk about auditing is making these transparent to somebody. Um, and there are actually many sources for this kind of transparency, at least taking uh, the UK uh, legal context into, into account. So one of them is the GDPR, data protection. Um, in certain cases, they provide provides broad amounts of account uh, accountability under the new principle, um, but also the transparency principle, um, uh, and, and more specifically around automated decisions that have been talked about. These specific, quite narrow, significant automated decisions, of which there aren't really very many that fall under this category. They're fully automated and fully uh, and, and significant with an equivalence to a legal effect. So, but that's only one real domain. If we think about one thing that's caused a lot of um, uh, outrage, uh, in, in this, especially from US war stories, algorithmic war stories we've seen, um, public sector decisions, decisions in the justice and policing sector, which aren't really covered by GDPR. I mean, often policing will fall into the law enforcement directive, which doesn't have meaningful logic of explanation or anything like Recital 71 um, that's, that's present. But there are other sources for transparency there. Freedom of information obliges people not to procure things that are too opaque, and that's what you see by talking to civil servants. The public sector equality duty, an active way of ensuring that uh, discriminate, uh, systems aren't being discriminatory, a legal obligation to actively promote anti-discrimination rather than just mitigate discrimination. Um, the new, well, you'll see in a few months, uh, probably the, coming out the UK government data science ethical framework, the, uh, basically the second version, which is much, much longer if anyone's seen the first one, which contains a lot of guidance on you really shouldn't be making black boxes to use for decision support within the public sector. And this is going to be codified in a, in a more formal way, even if it's not a legally binding text. Um, also different sectoral regulations. So this kind of is a context where actually a lot of time, the time public sector black boxes are quite hard to to build, which is great. So there's a, there's a sort of legal framework that we're building on. However, what do we mean by transparency? Because we don't have a, a black box system maybe being used in a really high stakes environment, if we've assured that it's possible to analyze it at least, um, who are we being transparent to? So these individual rights paradigms that we see within data protection uh, assume that people want transparency for particular decisions that are made about them. Now, this might be great at catching smoking guns if you've got really severely entrenched uh, racism or discrimination against another group of people, you might notice the system is behaving badly um, based on a series of individual queries. However, many of the things that we're discovering, uh, especially related to, say, uh, text analysis, 
um, really analysis of high dimensional data, internet fingerprinting and so on, are not problems which you could statistically discover from a single query or even just from a few single queries. Um, so in this case, statistically, individual rights paradigms fail to do anything um, useful in that, in that context, let alone when we consider the history of individual transparency rights and their real lack of use in data protection law. People have often found this burdensome. People have not made subject access requests, even though they've had the legal right to do so across Europe since 1995. It's mostly been journalists, people going to tribunal. So there's a bit of what we call the transparency fallacy in some work I've been doing, which is uh, we don't want to aim at individual rights. We have to think about who we are being transparent to. It's, it's useful to have these individual rights because they assure that systems are going to be made transparently. But we can't expect them to solve the problems that we identify. So we're thinking about aggregate outcomes, discrimination, monitoring and evaluation, effectiveness over a longer period of time, what works. In the UK, we have a lot of what works centers in the public sector which try to gather evidence on whether something works in the policing context or in the educational context. So these aggregate forms of transparency, uh, what would that look like in relation to, say, civil society? Article 80 of the GDPR provides some sort of group collective rights but it doesn't provide any rights of investigation for anyone who, who uses these rights to bring a complaint on someone else's behalf, or if it's triggered by member states on behalf of somebody who's never asked, authorized that complaint to be made. On behalf of a group, for example, in the UK we call this a super complaint, um, when we have that in other sections of law. So it, it's a format, but it doesn't provide special powers. Model repositories, perhaps for certain sectors, people have to deposit high stakes models in areas like libraries. Releasing them publicly, could work, like the open data movement. Um, it could provide some levels of transparency, but we worry about gaming. We also worry about these systems leaking personal data or being used to profile people very quickly. So all in all, we get a landscape which is it's quite tricky, but we do definitely need actors who can analyze models, have the legal ability to go in there or to receive them from somewhere else, to scrutinize them, uh, and, and that's a capacity we don't really have even if we had the legal rights right now. Even if there were legal rights for civil society organizations to do that, where is the funding coming from? Where is the expertise coming from? How is that being retained? What are the career paths of these people? Who are these socially engaged technologists? And why should people want to become one? Um, and I think in the future we've got to do a lot more <laughs> formalization of that from uh, a civil society point of view, while equally working on the legal rights to do that and to make it useful. That's great. So circling also back to to the role of, uh, of civil society, I, I want to kick off with one uh, kind of general question and then give it to the to the audience, um, because like I was recently working on a on a proposal, a big proposal for a lot of PhD students on algorithmic monitoring and the idea of algorithmic auditing. And the idea is they're going to be this new profession of people that are auditing algorithms. And, uh, and this involves uh, some, of the, uh, some of the people that have in computer science that have been doing a lot of work uh, on this topic. And, and, uh, but their, their imagination of where this auditing is going to take place is actually in the organizations developing and deploying the algorithms. So in contrast to that, I think what I've heard mostly from uh, the speakers uh, today, Bettina perhaps a bit less because she stayed more on the conceptual level of thinking about the problem, is this idea of doing research and finding out things from the outside, you know, which is the situation that you often find yourself in uh, as a civil society actor. Uh, I want to ask the question of how does this look from the inside? And maybe that can be also connected to what uh, Mark said earlier about there is some connection here to the privacy impact assessment, to the data protection impact assessment, which is an exercise that the controller is supposed to do. No, it's not something that is happening from the outside. So what does this algorithmic auditing look like when you think about it okay, as a starting point? That has to happen in the organization that is responsible for deploying the algorithm or the company, the software company that is developing the algorithm and, and uh, they get deployed uh, in the real world. Um, uh, is that, is that, is that going to be the main activity of algorithmic auditing uh, and monitoring? Or is it like, and what is the value of having this outside perspective, like to have this robust uh, outside perspective as well? Um, maybe in like, just mm -hmm. like maybe we'd like to hear from everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just, just a quick answer. On the inside, as I said, we already have a proposal, which is to make the algorithmic auditing part of the privacy impact assessment. 
And since we have a well-developed profession and it's growing with a GDPR, we actually think that's a very natural way uh, to get to the issue. And frankly, I think organizations have a self-interest in doing this, you see, because as these systems become more complex, their ability to determine how outputs are produced have been diminished. So this is not an area where I think companies necessarily get, you know, dragged kicking and screaming. But I want to make one further point on this and to Michael's remark about gaming, which we haven't talked about, and this is from the outside. This is the reason that I'm very much in favor of transparency as opposed to testing, right? So you talked about putting in data and seeing outcomes. We've just had the experience with very expert regulators the EPA in the United States testing vehicles from VW for emissions. That software was designed to reduce the emission output during the testing period. And when the testing period was over, the emission output went up to improve fuel economy. Okay? And it's very important to understand where that happened. That was with a sophisticated regulator. The same thing, by the way, happened with Uber. Uber escaped regulatory oversight by very sophisticated gaming of public officials who were responsible for managing trans transportation services. So I think all of these proposals that are predicated on, well, uh, tra you know, transparency is too complex, too difficult, let's put in data and see results. If you're a regulator on the outside, I would shake my head, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want to react yeah. also? Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, uh, quite in addition to that, um, I think even if the inside uh, is benevolent, and let's assume they often are, um, there is the blindness that comes from having developed something yourself or having developed the context in which this is going to generate value for you and your colleagues, and you just don't see um, all the dependencies. <laughs> So you know, uh, let me just make one uh, one example here, um, and the point is, of course, underlining uh, Michael's point. For example, that we really need an interdisciplinary um, working um, together on these issues. So at the moment, in the context of privacy impact assessments, there is a lot of very uh, fine-grained looking at the risk of de-anonymization uh, in certain data sets, and I think that's great. And you get into a more uh, differentiated analysis of which uh, stakeholders could be more at risk of being de-anonymized. But that risk in itself is very different for different kinds of people. And we forget that if we have developed an algorithm where uh, some individual is either anonymous or not anonymous and doesn't have any further properties like a human being. And we need other disciplines to tell us that thing. And there is all that research and, uh, I mean, there is, uh, there is a lot of great research going on and there's a lot of uh, great collaboration going on in um, outside uh, research as well. But that really has to be fostered because only then can we get to this rigor of really testing um, everything that uh, we forget when we just come from one place. Yes. Sorry, mate, I, I'll, I'll say something. Um, the uh, we, we, we risk in di our different countries have very different environments for say a public sector organization i'm going to deal public sector not deal with private sector because i think it's different internally auditing um, with a business logic compared to a public sector logic so in the uk um, we have actually many fewer internal proprietary models than say the us does that we've seen reported anyway um, and, and it's the same in Europe, actually, in several European countries. Not everywhere, but in several European countries. When you have quite a large, high-capacity, centralized part of the public sector, you don't necessarily need to procure very widely. If you've got a large police department, you can get an in-house modeler who works with a visual programming language, building a model that can be exported and analyzed in quite a varied number of ways. If you're a tiny police department, like many in the US are, you'd have very little option but to procure a prepackaged amount of software if there's nothing provided for you by cent uh, centrally. Um, and so this proprietary notion can be really hard um, to deal with from, from that point of view. So uh, there, is, there is guidance, I mean, there's, being, there's ongoing guidance that's going to be published soon from the UK about how you procure for auditability in relation to fairness and transparency and so on. But I think that's something we have to get to grips with. Um, another area which is very linked 
when you do have in-house modelers and they are uh, and they're actually you know, building models based on public sector data, for example, there's a usual underemphasis on the techn what, what some people call technical debt, but in general is this idea of maintenance. So these people are often said, oh, could you model this? Could you model this phenomena for us? And they go, yeah, yeah, okay, we, I can do that, model it. And they're like, oh, great, can you do this other one? And they're like, yeah, okay. And they, they have to then also maintain these models they've set up. And no one's being hired to maintain, because it's not a sexy job. No one wants to hire anything, you know, anyone to maintain a system. Um, so these people who are initially actually, you're usually quite tuned on, so turned on to issues like transparency and fairness, um, if you chat to them. They, um, they don't have the capacity to do it anymore. They get completely burdened. So I think we have to wonder what ro separation of roles we get inside organizations. Um, otherwise, we can have the best intentions, and organizations can have the best intentions, but misunderstand how that gets translated. Yeah, I don't have anything specifically extra to add, so maybe we can. <coughs> yeah, let's go to the audience. Questions. Chris? I, I have a question which is based around um, what we do in, in regulatory terms. There's a great, a really fascinating article that Mark published yesterday with Larry Irving. And I'll just give one quote, which I think really is the nicest thing I've read this, this, this year. And he's cringing because he knows that we're in a group of people who might take this either way. Progressives, <laughs> progressives gave up on democratic institutions and the rule of law. A new mantra of multi stakeholder engagement took hold. The fox didn't just guard their hen house, it designed it and wired it to the internet with 24 7 surveillance. The chickens never had a chance. So here we are, the chickens NGOs, um, to discuss these things. And I just wonder because, I mean, when Michael talks about how can we do things in the UK, most of the funding that we take, and for better or worse in Europe, we take most of, much of our research funding that could apply in this area from, um, from government, one way or another. Um, so of us to sneak under the radar. I mean, we're not actually going to have a centre for regulation of AI in the UK. We won't have a centre for AI ethics and innovation. Data, data ethics and innovation. Sorry, data <laughs> ethics and innovation. Thank you. It's actually even broader. Because we don't like to use the word regulation. And so thank you for introducing us to the word rule of, you know, the phrase rule of law in these things. Do you worry that we're still pussyfooting around this area and, and sort of talking about forms of of well-meaning non-profits trying to analyze AI as opposed to actually the rule of law thing that Well, let me first say, the reason I cringed is because this article just appeared. It's about the most radical thing I've written forever. And I wasn't even sure if it was going to be published. And when I had the sense it wasn't going to be published, my thought was, I'm okay with that too. Uh, <laughs> but now that it's out, care, out there, I'm okay with that too. Um, and it is very much a response to what happened in the U.S. over the last 25 years as the internet industry took hold of internet policy. And I think it's worth looking at. Now, I think it is also a U.S. story. And one of the reasons as a you know, privacy researcher and part-time academic, I so much enjoy coming to conferences in Brussels and other parts of the world I don't have that deep sense of foreboding uh, here that I do about the US. And I think part of it is that simple things like rule of law and respect for democratic institutions aren't really in doubt here. I mean, you have frictions, as you should, by the way, in political systems. But what we have happening right now in the US is actually something different, and it's quite troubling. Um, I don't want to vary too far from the panel discussion, and I know you have other questions, but Chris, just to come back to your point, part of what we're trying to do with EPIC through this campaign is drive these important policy issues through democratic institutions and through rule of law, respecting that people will have different views and there will be debate, and all that's fine. What we refuse to do is participate in multi-stakeholder proceedings or act as a focus group for some big company that simply wants to improve its messaging to the public by listening to a few articulate NGOs. And they say, oh, if we say stuff like we care about data protection and we value privacy and transparency, we'll be good. That's what we've rejected. So this is a campaign that is intended not only to seek the endpoint of algorithmic accountability, 
but to do so through democratic institutions. Well, I mean, yeah. So, like, yeah, clear. And I think that that's very. I I think that really relates to the topic. You know, like that question of like, shouldn't we just regulate these things? And we see a lot of work on ethics in relation to algorithms, which is another way to decontextualize. I, I think from the regulatory issues. You know, you present it as some kind of like ideal type phenomenon. Uh, what is it like with the, with the cars and the trolleys and all these kind of problems that you could do in ethics? And there's nothing against doing these kind of exercises in ethics, but systems have a context and there's something at stake in terms of like for the people and the people that work in organizations that deploy them. Uh, let's, uh, let's take another question uh, from if there are. Are there more questions? There must be. Yeah. I may have missed the point. We're talking about AI and about algorithm. Well, we have this casual kind of neural networks where, yes, we have learning algorithms. And yes, we have algorithms which produce a result. But are those the algorithms we want to test? Because uh, if you want to measure a neural network, this is uh, similar to a brain of a person. What, what can be the measurement? What, what are you looking for? Or are those uh, algorithmic uh, measurements only for uh, for vector machines or something like that? Great question. We, we've had I mean, yeah. systems for extraction of rules of neural networks in a research area for 30, 40 years. Um, and, and so I mean, this is not, it's often a bit of, I think it's a bit of an industry myth that's being peddled. Um, the real problem is when you've got high dimensional data, when you've got a lot of variables that are not humanly understandable and you've got thousands of them and they're combined in ways that are confusing. But that's often a problem of, a, a, basically it's a, it's, a, a feature of your problem that you're trying to tackle, less the analytics, I would say, is the biggest challenge. Well, the problems, uh, we want to do data analysis, and we can solve it with logic, we do not need those AI. Oh, yeah, often yeah. it's a problem, of just, you've got, you're asking the wrong question, if you want to solve this societal problem, the answer is not a neural network, yeah, that's, that's, that's fair enough. No, but are there other reactions? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, th that's, that's a huge area. They kind of, uh, how can we make algorithms or learning algorithms understandable, interpretable, um, and uh, transparent, and you know, all these other words. Um, and I think we are only at the beginning there, because so far we are uh, seldom even asking, does it make sense to a human, and to which human? Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I don't know, I have the feeling in this room, stakeholder has become a dirty word. Uh, so <laughs> I, <my> <laughs> okay. I just want to say when I say multiple stakeholders, I mean multiple p different people and stakeholders in a dem democratic society under the rule of law. Um, well yeah. said. <laughs> Uh, right, but but uh, I mean I, I think this is really what this is about. Like, uh, if transparency is one of the goals we have, and I think transparency <laughs> is one of the goals. It is in line with accountability, and it's not the same thing, but it's an important component. Um, then, what does that mean, uh, and what does that mean to whom, um, and how can we find out? And all of these things are big, big uh, research areas, but there's nothing we can do but do it, right? Will it mean in the end that we should ban uh, this kind of AI, which uh, cannot be put into a comprehensive mode, into a rule set by what we can do? I can make you a really complicated yeah. logistic regression if you want. Yeah. <laughs> so then this is, yeah, yeah. Th this is the question. I think that was, that was the opening panel of CPDP yeah. last year that I, uh, that I had the pleasure of being on <laughs> that panel, actually with Mark and, and with Krishna Gumadi and some others. And, and of course, this is a really, that's a really big question. If, if you cannot explain the system, you know, so are there maybe certain situations that you're not allowed to use that system for particular purposes? And uh, that's it. That's yeah. a very, uh, it's a big, uh, big debate. I want to pass on to, uh, to uh, see some other hands. Yep, please. Thank you. And I'm going to now repeat the question because, like, for the video, I've been asked to do that, and I saw I didn't like. I forgot. Uh, I small uh, comments uh, for the person at least as uh, considering the, the mm, limiting algorithmic audit. Do you think that uh, those limits, those bias, are in the auditor or in the algorithmic auditing itself? Because uh, 
It means that the limited of line are uh, on the auditor. And if we make an audit that is more collaborative, maybe they get absorbed. Okay, so this is a question for Bettina for how to deal with, like, how can you broaden that context by involving more people in doing the audit and just extending the scope uh, of that? Would that be the solution? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what I'm trying to argue, and I don't think we really have good procedures for that yet. And I'm we working need. On it. Uh, hmm? I'm working on it. That's perfect, so we need to talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, then another yeah. comment and could you say a little bit then, how do you do that and what is the context in which you mm -hmm. do that? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, collaboratively, like uh, with a tool, uh, more a similar tool explained by the lady on the left, uh, volunteers are uh, scraping their own Facebook timeline to permit a collaborative analysis of the Facebook algorithm. But uh, we cannot let the data database accessible to anybody because that can also permit some personal world information. No? So we are working on a framework that can guarantee some uh, ethically preserving uh, analysis. You can, uh, for example, do analysis that uh, want to inquire over phenomena, but not over user behavior. It, this is the, the best discrimination I, I found. Uh, if you can do an algorithm that uh, uh, uses as ID, so that the, the, the analysis <coughs> around, uh, is around this, this concept. And this concept is not a person, but a topic. You can extract results uh, that uh, are fully anonymous. That's in theory can permit a more collaborative judgment of what is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, also, other level of uh, ethical uh, agreement can be done. If you accept certain kind of ethical constraint, you can access the data database. But I've not yet uh, defined those uh, points. Uh, it can be follow up. Uh, and this is an academic research project? Uh, technically, or? yes, and we work uh, with the University of Amsterdam for it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I may add, yeah. the University of Amsterdam actually is doing really good work in this area of collaboratively trying to solve societal problems. So even in their, um, I forget the exact department, but media related people. Yeah. yeah. So um, so they have, so the basic idea is you develop some sort of a browser plugin that people who are interested in helping scientists solve some problems can download and then that browser plugin just whenever you're normally using your computer takes some of the data and sends it back to the scientists. That's the basic idea. And this is being done in Amsterdam for multiple, and it seems you're also doing it, and there are multiple other universities who are doing I it. I think this is the project uh, by, uh, by uh, led by Professor Natalie Helberg. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Personalized mm -hmm. communications, but there's a data Robin active uh, project mm -hmm. by yeah, Stefania yeah. Milan and, and yeah. others. Could, 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 I see the yeah, sure. Um, we could ask the companies to give us the data without having to, to scrape it in a really weird, non-representative no, no, way. I don't trust the API. I want to not, No, the not the API. API. Legally, you can legally oblige them to do this. I mean, I'm just thinking that we get stuck in this kind of, we have, I mean, Twitter has said that API is not representative. I know what you mean, we're trying to collect data, but it doesn't have to be this much effort, in theory, um, is, is just a, a point maybe to make. And the other thing is, it's consensus conferences in Denmark. Technology assessment has a really big history uh, participative, participatory technology assessment, consensus conferences where you get experts in for several days, members of the public, mm -hmm. educate about a particular technological phenomena, and people deliberate over what they think about it, is a really useful tool um, that is also underused in this area. Thank, thanks for that. Cassia, I saw your hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so quick point in response to what you just said. I think that's a very long way mm. to legally Maybe. Be able to use yeah. all the input for every user taking part in, into our experiment. We need two years to fight for data from two years back. I think still doing this in a tech hacking way is probably faster. I'm not saying do it now. I'm just saying you know, we could think about it. People don't really mention that as a possibility, but like Chris was saying, like regulation is, is a dirty word. Right. I mean, last session we discussed how to use it. I, I don't think we, we, we but okay. Uh, I wanted to get back to two points that you made before. One on the who should we do the auditing. When I discussed the problem with some people from the banking sector, they made me aware of the fact that this is in Poland. Apparently, the financial supervisory authority is auditing. Um, algorithms used by uh, for credit scoring. Uh, it can be true also for stock markets. So maybe just a quick uh, overview of, of, of your opinions. Uh, do you know any authorities anywhere in the world who did a good job on that? And how can we check the results of those aud 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 audits apparently being done in, for example, financial world? I wasn't aware of this, so I never looked into this myself. 
And the uh, second issue you mentioned, uh, started discussing already uh, what should be uh, the subject of the audit. Can we imagine for a second the perfect result of the audit? How, can you imagine how, how such a report or, I mean, basically yeah. what should it be? Is it a graph or is it Excel sheet or yeah. is it a report? It's or just a big tick, I think. Well, what is <laughs> <it>? <laughs> um, the, the, the first one, yeah, credit score, fan, 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 score <laughs> and financial scoring had a really big detailed legal history. Um, I, I'm not sure they've always been auditing for the questions we're concerned about today. Some areas, certain types of fairness, certain types of discrimination, for example. But there are a lot of sectoral regulations, medical regulation is another one, which are pretty well developed and we can, we can definitely build on that. Um, the second part is, uh, is really interesting. And I think this is why it's really difficult to regulate. We had the fair information principles um, and those were really very much, uh, FIPS were really useful in shaping data protection law. Um, but we haven't really got the same for profiling because data is, is, is a bit more delimited. We capture data from certain kinds of sensors, certain kinds of analysis, uh, just, just certain kinds of files, so we can get to grips with it. Decision making is gigantic. Everyone makes decisions all the time in all parts of their life, so it's sort of a big funnel that diverges. So making principles that make a checklist for what to do is really very, very difficult. So I think sometimes it's about, you know, in creating a, a, an environment where you can creatively and rigorously define what that audit needs to look like in the context which, where it's happening. It's a wicked problem, you've got to decide on the ends, you've got to decide on the means, it's very political, um, but it's okay. Yeah, we just have to learn how to do it creatively and thoroughly each time and justify why we did it that way. And that's really hard to write into law or policy. So yeah. Mark, Mark wants to. Society. Well, I just Mark wants to jump in, and I, I just want to add like one little question to that too. Is like, how does that look like? And you said like one tick, you <laughs> know, like. And I think a lot of people are very worried, and maybe rightfully so, that a lot of these audits and a lot of like also the data protection impact assessment is turning into an exercise that doesn't really produce a lot of value in practice. And okay. if we go if we go tomorrow to CPDP and we take all the marketing materials out of the bag. It is full of like methods to do data protection impact assessments that if you are from this field and you care really about the values underlying data protection and privacy, you pull your hairs out here and there. No? And uh, so I, like, maybe you can well, address that. Like how, how can we get like how can we get to value? So there, so there are two distinct topics here that I think we need to keep separate. One is privacy impact assessment and the other is algorithmic accountability algorithmic transparency. <coughs> now I will say if you go to the EPIC website on both topics you'll find a lot of material. Some of it's our own work but some of it is also a survey of the literature. So we're very interested for example in the policy frameworks for algorithmic accountability and we've pulled together the uh, EU ACM and the IEEE and the Asalamar and the Japanese uh, trade mm -hmm. and manufacturing uh, industry. Very important by the way. Japan has a very strong national interest in establishing algorithmic accountability for some fascinating trade, economic, and social uh, reasons. So all of those frameworks you'll find at our website, and I think you'll find them uh, useful. Um, I will also mention briefly um, two specific matters that we pursued under the Freedom of Information Act to try to make concrete, you know, what does the checkbox look like? We brought a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the U.S. agency CBP, Custom and Border Protection, and you'll find this online also, for something called the Analytic Framework for Intelligence. Well, AFI is the CBP technique for evaluating everybody who enters the United States, including U.S. citizens, and it actually assigns a terrorist risk assessment from zero to one, the likelihood that you're gonna blow up a skyscraper is in that, you know, determination. And we were absolutely fascinated, we're still litigating this case, absolutely fascinated to know in that rule, however that number's derived, is race a factor? Is nationality a factor? Is age a factor? How could a government assign a score to an individual based on those characteristics, permanent characteristics of a person's identity. So that I think is a very important issue. And the other was I was going to mention, we're also trying to get a forensic technique in the criminal justice system that establishes the probability of a DNA match. So you go to a crime scene and you say, well, we have the DNA 
of the rape suspect. And it's 92% certain that the person in custody's DNA matches the custody of the rape suspect. And the defense attorney says, well, this is obviously significant evidence. How did you derive that 92% number? I said, well, I'm, we're sorry, it's proprietary, actually. It's the business secret. Well, do you know you have the right person? Did you invert the numbers? Was it 29 instead of 92? I mean, all of these very interesting questions that arise when you think in very concrete circumstances about an agency making a determination about a particular individual. Can I? Thank you. Yeah, Bettina. Yeah. yeah. Can I just follow up on that? I, I think we have at least three big columns for these. Uh, let's say, what what does it look like? Uh, we will always have people looking for checkboxes and ticks and scores uh, because in the end, uh, most uh, companies and e uh, even other agents want some security under law. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the right thing and my procedures are okay. So I, I don't think we can completely escape that. Um, at the same time, we need to make sure we always have these points of intervention where people can complain and ask uh, if things go wrong and that we have these procedural safeguards all along the process and don't lose them in favor of some score that summarizes everything. And the third pillar has to be that research and civil society has to keep questioning the scores and the procedural safeguards because they will never be perfect. And they will always rely on a whole host of assumptions about concepts um, that are, you know, just not that eternal as uh, some people would like them to be. But the question and then we need to understand what has been done, at least, and, and, and yeah. get some meaningful results. So yes. I yes. Know if I get uh, input yeah. data, output uh, categories, yes. and some logic in between, I can ask more about this logic that I still don't right. understand. But if I don't exactly. get the logic in between at all, I only get a tick box uh, or a check box or, or input and output. Yes. It doesn't really tell me anything about the logic, whether there was discrimination involved or any other bias. Right, but uh, what is an explanation for you may not be an explanation for me or vice versa. And so <laughs> this will have to be negotiated as well. Sure, sure. John Claudio. Yeah. yeah. A step behind. Uh, about your shared concern about semi automated uh, uh, decisions. No? Uh, so you are all saying more or less that according to the GDPR, you know, the scope of Article 15 and 22 is very limited mm -hmm. because it's just referred to solely automated decision making. Actually, I would not fully agree with this because it's decision based solely on. So I mean, they are not automated decisions, they are human de decisions that <laughs> can be based on solely automated. And also according to Article 29 Working Party and according to Information Commissioner Office in the UK, the interpretation of this uh, based on solely automated should be wider, and it means that when there is no influential human uh, um, intervention, I mean, when there is no uh, human addition, but just an automatic human action, okay, we are within the scope. I mean, semi-automatic decisions should be also, according to this wide interpretation of Article 29 Working Party, and the definition of Article 22, because what is human decision is something that uh, is related to human capabilities. And human capabilities is critical agency of data controller. If I just see the algorithm score and I just apply a result, yeah, it's not fully automated. I'm doing some semi-automation, but it's quite, you know, there's nothing added value that me as a human, I'm, I'm giving. So yeah, maybe we should stress on uh, GDPR as much as we can because, you know, there, there is some, uh, you know, I'm more optimist on <laughs> legal interpretation. I, I know that Michael has an opposite view. But uh, no, I don't, not quite. So we wrote a commentary on the guidance in computer law and security view that's open access. There's a lot to get open access there. But, um, uh, the, <coughs> one of the, based on that, yeah, that discussion, this widens what you need to audit, we, we note. So, 
the whole idea that you actually need to capture how often people disagree with a decision, how often people take a divergent view <coughs> to the system in order to justify retaining that um, exemption that you're not solely based on automated processing and therefore Article 22 and perhaps stuff in Article 15 that's a bit less clear um, uh, don't apply. And that's a really interesting concept because that says auditing is much more about the entire process, about your organizational um, setup. Um, and I think that's going to be something we're going to have to learn how to do. And we, we tried to get this in the House of Lords in the UK, now in the House of Commons, pushed onto the bill, meaningful input from the Article 29 Working Party written into the Data Protection Bill, refused again and again by government who even you know, floundered and misquoted the law, the law in the House, which will cause a bit of a problem. Um, so I think it's a bit of a weird one, how we organisationally expect companies to do that monitoring. What does, what does measuring over-reliance look like? Um, so, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any inputs on, on how you might do that. So just the IBM, we call it IBM Watson Oncology project shut down because the doctors disagreed with the AI mm -hmm. you know, the, because there are some examples where the, the Facebook had to shut down an AI project where two AIs were talking to each other and Facebook couldn't understand what they were saying. I mean, this was real Terminator stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, but there's different interpretations yeah. of that yeah, thing as well. I would well. say that's a bit of a... <laughs> yeah. But it makes a good movie. It makes a good movie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I think we're slowly running uh, to, uh, to the time uh, limit. Um, is there a last question? Chris, we already had to. It, like it's just a quick question. Uh, Do we think we're learning enough from how the financial regulators uh, regulate uh, the various types of mm. AI that they're looking at? Because mm. I always worry there's a gap between the state of the art, which is clearly going to hit them first, because A, hey, that's where it's going to be made in it. And, uh, most AI that caused a financial crisis was very expertly programmed in Excel, um, <laughs> linked spreadsheets going together, which you couldn't debug. Well, uh, and that, I think that's that was a decade ago. No, no, but, but even still today, I think this is this is the kind of stuff that really causes huge problems. And it was the same with the Aqua book in the UK government. Why you had to revise analysis because there were just fundamental coding errors. And so there's there's almost a separate two separate things we can learn from this. One of them is how you learn to stop complete fuck-ups in, in programming. Um, and then how you do the more nuanced stuff. But I wonder what we have to prioritize. I mean, you can do both at once, but there yeah, yeah, maybe if, if I'm allowed also like to, 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 question, <coughs> like, to answer that question. I think, I think there's, there's, because partly there is a lot of emphasis on the GDPR and the data protection <laughs> framework, which is a kind of a meta-regulatory framework that applies across a different context, you forget that when it's about like automated decision making and decision decision making in general or the exercise of power in different contexts different laws apply already we do not have to reinvent the wheel we have a right to due process no like which is uh, applicable uh, like in a public sector context in, in particular we have uh, we have uh, transparency laws that can be used actually the, uh, as a strategy to create transparency for algorithmic processes but we have competition law there was a 10 million uh, euro tender uh, to uh, monitor Google's algorithms and if they're complying with uh, the uh, agreement that was made on the ranking algorithms, which is a competition law standard of fairness. And, and there's a lot happening uh, in that context. There's a proposal coming up from the European Commission on business to platform fairness. Now, how are you being treated as an, as an e-commerce uh, is a website on these different platforms that determine your, your viability as a business. There's actually regulation coming up on that, no regulation in the business to business context. Um, and there's a variety of other laws, and I mean, they're, de they're de developed differently in different member states, but administrative law is, of course, uh, has all these principles that you can apply, and we do not have to reinvent uh, the principles. Sometimes those principles can come into tension, of course. Uh, and the same in contractual relationship, in employer-employee relationship, we have labor law. Now, we do not have to completely reinvent standards of fairness in the, in the labor context. This makes this uh, discussion, of course, uh, complicated. Could uh, I, end, uh, yeah, the, could the, I like, end with yeah. one provocation? Okay. That would be great. So yeah. here's, here's my <laughs> final provocation. I think in our broad realm of data protection law, we have a fairly good understanding 
of the relationship between the data subject and the data holder. And so much of the work we do is based on this relationship. What makes this topic particularly interesting and challenging is that there's actually a third entity out there, which is the AI. And we have to seriously consider <coughs> the potential independence of that decision-making process. My answer to your question, Chris, is that this is where I think the data subject and the data holder have a joint interest in the accountability of the AI, because even organizations are losing control over the decision-making process. That's a very serious issue. Any other last words? It's their own fault. I'd say you manage and deploy models. Um, data controllers are often using things that are not anywhere AI, anything mystical. Um, and uh, you can robustly deploy models. We know, how to, we know how to do this. We know how to use analysis and data sensibly within organizational processes. And a problem is now there's a lot of snake oil out there. That we need to upskill people. We need to give them also a social contract to society at the same time because this stuff is not going to be flagged. The nuanced issues are not going to be dealt with unless people on the ground, inside rooms that people didn't think were very important, notice important societal aspects of the technology that were not flagged either by vendors uh, in the previous streams of data or by external uh, actors in civil society. Because that's where a lot of the issues are most visible and that's where you need the eyes on them. Bettina. <laughs> kind of a provocation for the mark provocation. Uh, since super intelligence is nowhere near around the corner, uh, what we need to do is call the bullshit on people believing that the AI is doing something themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always people making some decision and we need to have to find out who these people are. And only people can be accountable because only people can fear consequences. Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, really so that's